I mean, the fear that comes up, of course, is that this is happening to all of us and it's, I can't escape it. And I can't just say it's that person over there. So the opportunity there is that we really get to break down that separateness and that all of a sudden starts to break up the fear because all of a sudden it's not my fear, it's the fear. And I'm not really different and separate. I'm connected to these other people. And I think that that's really a beautiful thing. It's an opportunity for us. Welcome to Beyond Theory, a podcast powered by Meadows Behavioral Healthcare that brings you in-depth conversations from the front lines of mental health and addiction recovery. I'm David Condos. As Chief Medical Officer with the Meadows, Dr. John Caldwell knows how easily anxiety can overwhelm us. And this is especially true in a time of uncertainty like the COVID-19 pandemic. But instead of running from fear, what if we lean into it? Can confronting the reality of our own powerlessness actually loosen fear's grip? Let's get out of the abstract and see how this applies in the real world. It's time to go beyond theory. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. John Caldwell, who's joining us live from Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, David. Nice to be here. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, you know, right now this conversation is taking place in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so, you know, things are developing rapidly. There's breaking news. There's new public health recommendations. Things are changing, you know, by the minute. And so, you know, all of this uncertainty can understandably cause a, you know, specific reaction, a common reaction, and that's fear. And so, let, you know, let's let's start the conversation there. You know, first, kind of setting the foundation for what is fear, what what's its evolutionary function, uh, what what is the role that it plays. Yeah, I uh, I got in the car this morning actually, and I felt a tickle on my hand, and I looked down, and it was a spider on my hand, and I quickly sort of flicked my hand towards the uh, the passenger side floor mat hoping to dislodge the spider. And there was understandably this little bit of fear. And if you want to activate the limbic or emotional part of the brain, especially around fear, one of the reliable ways to do that is to show people a picture of a spider. And you can do this in the brain scanner. And the part of the brain that is sort of the smoke alarm for something fearful will light up right away. So fear has this um, evolutionary function where it helps to alert us of possible dangers in our environment. Uh, It's a very potent emotion. We um, we probably all have felt it, recognize it. And um, so I'm not, of course, saying that fear is bad. And especially during this time of of, uh, COVID-19, not bad, not wrong. But what I found really interesting is the way that fear can sometimes run amok and really have a strong presence in our life to the point where it can control us. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that um, we can only have these positive emotions or these um, positive experiences in times of, you know, pleasant, you know, non-crisis, but actually the crisis itself can be a, a gateway, a doorway into uh, some really deeper understanding and deeper ways of being with ourselves and with other people. So I got really interested about writing about that. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, when you're, when you're looking at the fear that a lot of people are experiencing right now, I, know, I, I feel like a lot of it can be boiled down to one specific thing, and that's this sense of powerlessness. You know, all these things are swirling around, uh, so much is out of our control. Um, why is that specific fear such a difficult fear to overcome, you know, especially in a time like this? Well, if you think about it, as humans, we've really done an amazing job of mastering our environment, right? Like uh, we've learned to use tools of various kinds to really master our environment and sometimes probably to the detriment of the environment and other creatures around us, we have to be careful. But at our basic core, we're still very um, vulnerable human beings. And so we live in a world and an environment where 
we sometimes forget our own vulnerability. We sometimes forget how powerless we are over certain things. Um, it doesn't take much for us to remember that, like a natural disaster, for example. And we realize just how insignificant we are in the face of Mother Nature, for example. But those things happen rarely enough that we can develop this sense that, um, that we have a, a lot of control in our life, that things are going to work out as we plan them, that we can understand what's coming around the corner, that we can predict the future to some degree, um, that bad things won't happen to us or the people that we love. And we, we can become pretty, um, we can become pretty sure of that. And then something like COVID-19 coronavirus comes along and it really starts to rattle the foundation of that, um, that really sort of uh, false belief that we have control. And, um, and I think, you know, that feeling of powerlessness is deeply, deeply um, fearful to us. Uh, we, we sort of like to think that we're walking on bedrock, you know, that we, we can put a flag in something really solid. And uh, when stuff like this happens, we realize that we're really walking around on sand. It's not as firm as we thought. And that can be really destabilizing. Uh, it can really shake the core of who we think we are. Um, I think coronavirus, COVID-19 has really done that for a lot of us. Yeah. And I like how uh, you were, when we were talking earlier, you were describing it as this kind of mental gymnastics that we, that we go to, to r distract ourselves from the reality of our own powerlessness. And in some, a lot of ways, that's good. It allows us to go about our daily lives without, you know, thinking about the reality of death all day. And, and there, there are good things about that. But like, but like you were just saying, it's also good to, to face that reality and, and there can, there can be good things that come out of, of, uh, that awareness. Yes. Um, I've been practicing some of these, um, some of these contemplative techniques and sort of philosophical ideas. I've been kicking them around for a while and I spent like a year of my practice was devoted to the idea of getting comfortable with powerlessness. Um, and, that whole year I spent really trying to understand that I didn't have as much control as I would like. And one of the things I would sometimes do is, um, this can sound a little bit weird or morbid, but while driving, when a car would pass me, I would remind myself that, that I didn't have a lot of power over what that car was going to do. Um, and that there was always the potential that something would go not as planned and that my life would take a drastic turn. And, you know, some people would say, well, why would you want to put yourself through that sort of, you know, fantasy of something bad happening? But I'll tell you what, when you do that, it's like the desert flowers on the drive home all of a sudden are a little brighter, you know, cause it's like, yeah, this is a precious moment. This is, um, this is a gift right now that I have. And so I think there can be a real value in, in, a, in a practice that sort of uh, searches for um, a greater balance with the powerlessness that we actually have in this life. Mm, yeah. And so uh, zooming into our current context, you know, here, here in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, let's talk through three of the key fears that uh, people are experiencing now. They've, they've always been common, but they're really being brought to the surface uh, by, by the situation we're in. And so the first one is this fear of being socially disconnected. So to, to start off, could you describe why that aspect of social connection, why, why is that so important to our brains? Yeah. I think that's one of the key aspects of this um, crisis, really. Uh, you know, in other crises that we've experienced, oftentimes there's the ability to still connect with people. Mm -hmm. And I remember, for example, exactly where I was the moment I saw the TV screen um, showing 9-11. Um, and I remember the first thing I wanted to do, I was uh, geographically separated from family and loved ones at that time. And the first thing I wanted to do was to call people I loved and say, are you seeing what I'm seeing, right? There's this natural tendency for us to reach out and connect with people. 
In fact, um, you know, we're highly social creatures. And part of the way that we regulate fear and regulate a lot of other emotions is through social connection. Um, and so it's so natural for us to want to reach out and touch, to put a hand on the shoulder, to hug somebody that we love and trust. And this crisis has really interrupted that um, in a way that I think really intensifies the fear, both the fear that we may not be able to connect, that we may lose people that we love, but also just that there's all of this fear in our body that we're not able to regulate through one of the main ways that we would normally regulate. And there's just this physical, literal physical experience of not being able to connect with people. The, the experience of having connection with others is a biological experience. It's a biological need, uh, like, you know, food and water. We need to connect. Um, and when we don't have that, we suffer. Also, in times of crisis, it usually helps to mobilize, to, to take action, you know, to go out and help. And if you think about an earthquake or a tornado, you know, people mobilize and they go and they, they help each other, right? They rebuild. And the social distancing, as important as it is and as necessary as it is, has interrupted that kind of natural um, coping mechanism to reach out and connect and join arms and join hands and figure things out. So this has been a really tough crisis for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know before we were recording, you were describing it as kind of this double whammy that, that you were talking about is that not only are we feeling more isolated and that's one side of it, but also having that social connection, even, you know, shaking a hand, giving someone a hug, seeing somebody in person, that is one of the key ways that we regulate our other fears of which we are feeling many right now. And so it really does seem like a unique situation. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. And so um, dur during a time like this, as you described, the social distancing is, you know, necessary right now. Um, but how do we find that balance between protecting ourselves, protecting the, you know, the people we love around us, but not drifting into total isolation? Yeah. So... You know, social distancing doesn't have to mean, you know, social disconnect. And we're really fortunate that we live in a time where we have technology that can really facilitate a lot of connection and meaningful connection. Um, you know, I mean, these kind of video uh, connecting is really powerful. Um, I've been doing a lot more texting and group texting with family. Um, I also think that when we feel that sense of disconnect, when we feel that longing inside to connect with somebody, I think we can move into that too and recognize that that's one of the gifts of this. And it's important to remember that um, even a crisis like this comes with gifts. You know, It's not all black and white. It's not all bad. And there's some good that comes from this. And one of the things that has done for me is it helps me to recognize that my relationships with others are really important to me and not to be taken for granted. And um, maybe there's been hurt, maybe some resentments have built up. This is the time to say, yeah, like I'm ready to put that aside, you know? Um, and we can use this as an opportunity to really move in, lean into those connections that maybe have been troubled or difficult in the past. And um, just remember that we don't, we don't always know the future. And um, why not? Uh, why not move in and really, you know, sort of, um, sort of cultivate and and foster those connections while we have this time. Yeah. And so the second uh, key fear that that we'll highlight in this conversation is how the pandemic has hit home for us. And so it's kind of, you know, breaking down the uh, coping mechanism that we often have where we'll say like, oh, it's on the other side of the world, or it's, you know, it kind of turns into this us versus them, you know, to, to kind of uh, separate us, distance us from, from th you know, things that are happening. Um, how is this pandemic kind of dismantling that, that coping mechanism? Yeah. <laughs> I think this is a really interesting part of this. I get really, uh, really excited about what can happen if we lean into this. So our brain naturally wants to create these like groupings of things and say, oh, that's, 
that's them and this is us. This is how this person is different and this is how I'm me and not them and I have a different way of life and I have a different language and, and we create a lot of separateness and our brain just naturally does that. It's not a bad thing. It's just, you know, our brain wants to kind of categorize the world so it's easier to kind of metabolize and distinguish things. But it can be damaging, right? Because when it comes down to it, some of those distinctions, some of those differences can be hurtful and aren't really that important. So the leaning in opportunity here with that, I mean, the fear that comes up, of course, is that this is happening to all of us and it's, I can't escape it. And I can't just say it's, it's, it's that person over there um, because coronavirus is happening all over the world to each of us. And we're all affected by it at the same time. And so the fear is that the fear is intensified because it's up close and personal. It's right on my doorstep. I can't say this is happening to them, someone else. It's happening to all of us, you know? So the opportunity there is that we really get to break down that separateness, that distinction. And we really get to say, yeah, I'm just part of this great human family. I'm just like another person and I'm not really different and separate. I'm connected to these other people. And that all of a sudden starts to break up the fear because all of a sudden it's not my fear. It's the fear, right? It's not like I'm unique and special. It's all of a sudden like, oh yeah, this is just what humans go through. And no matter who we are, no matter what we look like, you know, we all experience this in the same way. And I think that that's really a beautiful thing. It's an opportunity for us. Yeah. To kind of reconnect with that shared humanity. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So then the, uh, the final, uh, key fear that, that we're going to discuss here today is the anxiety surrounding our own mortality surrounding death, which, which I know you've called kind of this ultimate sign of our powerlessness. And like we were talking about earlier, you know, our brain is really good at having these mental gymnastics where, you know, fortunately we don't have to, you know, be bogged down thinking about this all day. We, you know, our brain has ways to allow us to go about our lives, but that, you know, it's a little bit harder to escape right now in, in a situation like this. And so that can be a challenge that can be really, you know, hard for a lot of people, but, but then you're, you're kind of finding the silver lining in this. And, and could you describe for us how facing this reality of our own fragility of our own mortality, how, how can that ultimately be a good thing for us as we grow? Yeah. Well, I actually was a little worried about writing this part of the article. Um, and when I sent it off to, to the Meadows, I thought, I said, you may not want this article because, you know, I was kind of moving directly in. And, um, but this is, I mean, you know, it's pretty core to who we are, that there's some part of us deep inside that knows that this is fragile that, you know, we just don't have as much control over how long we're here on this earth as we think we do. And we push that idea out all the time. Um, but with coronavirus, you know, it's, it's just uh, those defense mechanisms that we have to not recognize our own mortality are really dismantled and broke down, like you said. And so we're really faced with this fear uh, that comes up around the fragility of life, you know? Um, and that's heavy. It's deep. Uh, my, so my first week in medical school, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother had a stroke and, um, we thought she might not make it. And I realized at that moment that, um, I was ill-equipped to be a physician and take care of people who were facing death because I wasn't ready to face death. Uh, in the people I loved and in, in my own life. And so I started doing a lot of work around death and dying. And uh, throughout my residency training, I continued that work and really worked with a lot of people who were facing facing death and trying to understand that process um, and really tried to move in. And it's interesting that um, I lost my I lost that grandmother last week, uh, not to coronavirus, but she was in a care home and just passed away. And so you know, in a very sort of um, 
theoretical way, you know, death has been on my mind as, uh, as this whole coronavirus has been going on. But actually in a very personal way, um, you know, even after writing the article, losing my grandmother, it was, you know, it was really front and center. And um, so, you know, that's the ultimate powerlessness is that we don't even know how long we're going to be here. All the stuff that we have around us, all the people, the things that we've collected, all of the dreams and fantasies that we have for our future are called into question uh, when we come into contact with the true powerlessness of, of this mortality, this, um, this life. So this is a heavy uh, fear and almost nobody wants to lean into that. You know, uh, the natural human condition is, I don't want, I don't want to touch that. You know, so this is a, this is a tall order. But I think the payoff is, you know, the degree to which this fear can really uh, get us going it is to sort of, sort of, you know, the same degree of um, of a gift. Is there waiting for us if we can move in and so there's actually kind of a comfort in being connected with reality so moving in and understanding that life is fragile in a very paradoxical way feels comforting because we're actually in touch with the truth we're actually in touch with reality and that gets us that really sharpens our our senses around present moment awareness you know and people who do a lot of this practice actually practice um, imagining or being in touch with the fragility of life as a way of being even more in tune with the present moment. So there's a lot of gifts in just being in touch with reality. I'm not asking us to do anything, but just be aware of the truth, you know. Um, and there's real power in um, in being uh, in in contact with the truth. Yeah. And so talking about, you know, being in, in contact with that present moment, that's getting into some mindfulness, which I know you, you wanted to share with us some kind of practical tips and techniques that, that people might, might be able to, to take home and use when they feel this fear rising up in them. Could, could you take, take some time to share some one or two of those right now? You bet. Well, the first thing is that um, we have to have an intention to really try and be present. And so maybe we might just start our day with even like a little uh, a little note card by the bed. Or maybe we develop a practice of taking a walk in the morning or at night. Maybe we have prayer. Maybe there's yoga, movement, dance. Uh, maybe it's a sitting meditation. Some sort of practice or reminder about how we want to show up in the world so that we connect with that deeper intention of oh yeah, I want to pay attention to what's coming up in my life. I want to say yes to my experience as it is, right? So that's the first thing is that intention. And then we need to work with this kind of wild monkey mind of ours because it will it'll really attach to the fear. It's seductive. It pulls us in, you know, and we have to be cautious about that. Yes, pay attention to the fear. Don't push it away, but just notice it. So start to really practice noticing paying attention to when the fear comes up. And when it comes up, see if you can just let it be without having to change it, fix it, numb it, escape it, just tumble into it without even being aware that you're in it. Go into sort of worst case scenario, what if scenarios, right? See if you can let, like, let go of some of those patterns and just notice the fear, just go, Ah, oh, there it is. And it can be helpful to apply just a very non-judgmental um, label to it. Like, oh yeah, I'm noticing some fear. Not bad, not wrong. Just notice it, right? And then you might start to like move in and lean in a little bit. So use some of the practices that we've been talking about today. Of get the courage to lean in. It really does take courage. And you might start to say, Okay, so I'm feeling fear. It's okay to feel fear, but I don't want this fear to sort of like run my life, right? So what am I really afraid of? Oh, I'm afraid that life won't be the same. Okay. All right, that's all right. That's a reasonable fear. Notice the fear in the body. Stay with it in the body. 
Try not to get into a whole bunch of made-up scenarios because that usually takes us way into the future or back into the past with things that we can't change. And then use some practices like reaching out to other people, connecting with people that we love, connecting with our truth about what we know about ourselves in this life, being able to um, recognize that there might be some gifts that come from this process. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of some of the process. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Caldwell, thank you again for your time. Uh, before, before we leave people, um, what, what's um, a word of hope? that you'd, you'd like to leave listeners with, you know, how can we come out of this season um, in a better place, you know, mentally, emotionally, relationally than we entered it? Yeah. Well, I've been described as uh, annoyingly optimistic. So um, I have to just, you know, start with that caveat. Uh, and I, I recognize that there's a lot of pain and suffering. Um, there's no doubt that this is going to really alter the way that we think about the world. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this. Um, and, and frankly, uh, you know, I feel very blessed in my own life. And I know that there are people who are struggling in ways that I don't even understand. So I guess I just want to really um, acknowledge that and, and recognize, um, have a lot of compassion for where people are at. And I don't, I don't really believe that everything happens for a reason. I think sometimes there's just randomness in life and things that we can't fully control. But I do believe that we can do the best that we can with the hand that we're dealt. So even though there may not be, a, in my mind, sort of a grand overarching purpose to all of these things, I do think that we can accept what is happening and do our best with it. So I think that's one thing to remember is to remind ourselves that we may not have as much control, but we can, there are some things we can control and there are some things that we can do. We can, we can choose how we decide to show up in this moment. Um, how we, how we, um, sort of walk through this critical moment, this crisis. Um, another, uh, another thing to think about is even in difficult moments, we can be very grateful and thankful. So when it, when that grip of fear has really got us, sometimes it helps just to sort of start counting, like, what am I, what am I grateful for? What do I have in my life? What are the things I have going for me? And that can start to break up some of the fear um, and some of the, the ideas around, you know, scarcity and not having enough. I think it's also useful to remind ourselves that we as humans and we as a culture and a people and a world have been through difficult things. When I attended my grandmother's funeral through live stream, um, there were these beautiful stories of what it was like for her to go through the depression. And her whole entire family had scarlet fever and she lost a sibling. And she worked in the factories when her husband was flying a jet in World War II. And I realized that we've been through difficult things. Uh, we're, we're resilient, creative um, people with grit, you know? And uh, so I trust in that ability. I trust in our ability to get through difficult times. Um, and I think we will find ways to, to get through this, right? We will find ways to come through it. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of learning that can happen in the process. Sometimes difficult challenges can be our greatest teachers. And it's hard to remember that in the moment of the difficulty. I know it is. Um, but we might look back on this as a time when we really grew a great deal and maybe our family structure changed in some ways that allowed us to be more present and open. Maybe we realized how important things are, certain things in our life. Um, so there, there can be good that comes out of challenge and difficulty. Dr. John Caldwell is a psychiatrist and clinical research investigator who specializes in treating those healing from trauma and addictive behaviors. He currently serves as Chief Medical Officer with The Meadows in Wickenburg, Arizona. Learn more about their treatment approach at themeadows.com. Beyond Theory is produced, written, and edited by me, David Condos. You can discover more from this podcast, including extended videos of each conversation 
at beyondtheorypodcast.com. Finally, thank you for listening. And I hope you'll join us again next time for another episode of Beyond Theory. Beyond Theory.